Mrs. Brinda Sumaya is our next esteemed speaker. Mrs. Sumaya is an architect and urban conservationist. Upon completion of her Bachelor of Architecture from Mumbai University and her Master of Arts from Smith College in Northampton, USA, she started her firm Sumaya and Kalapa Consultants in 1978 in Mumbai, India. In May 2012, she was the recipient of the honorary doctorate for her alma mater, Smith College. In 2014, she was awarded the Indian Institute of Architects, Babura Matre Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement. Over three decades, she has merged architecture, conservation, and social equity in projects ranging from institutional campuses and rehabilitation of an earthquake torn village to the restoration of an 18th century cathedral, showing that progress in history need not be at odds. Her philosophy, the architect's role is that of a guardian. His is the conscience of the built and an unbuilt environment. Master planning and building design of multiple corporate and educational campuses has become one of her areas of expertise. Some of these award-winning campuses include Tata Consultancy Services, Banyan Park, Mumbai, Nalanda International School, Vadodara, and Zensa Technologies, Pune. Her firm has recently won the co competition for the restoration and upgradation of the historic Louis Khan buildings of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, IIMA. She chaired a conference and organized a seminal exhibition on the work of women architects with a focus on South Asia in Mumbai. In addition, the Hecker Foundation has brought out several books and documents, such as An Emancipated Place, Women in Architecture, 2000 Plus, Salad Sentinels, Traditional Architecture of Kurk, The Cathedral Schools Portfolio, and the Mumbai Esplanade Project. I invite you, ma'am, to kindly come to the dais and present. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the Charles Korea Foundation for this privilege today. I grew up in Mumbai in the 60s and 70s. It was a city of about 4 million people. Today, the greater metropolitan region is home to over 22 million people. So this kind of monumental growth has to bring monumental challenges and mind-boggling changes around us. I think all of us know today these statistics, but it's important to remind one that we are now 7 billion people and a large number of them live in cities. In India, we have 380 million people, almost 35% of the population living in cities, and by 2050, we're going to be almost 50%. So this is going to be the single biggest reason for the high rate of change that's around us. We just have to look back at our Indus Valley civilization, our very own, and we will find that when they planned cities, they first created the infrastructure and then moved into the city. And for that time, the cities they built were as big as building a Manhattan today. But today, the lack of planning and infrastructure has caused many of the perilous problems that we have today. So where is our next train stop? As our country hurtles along with its many Indias within it, how easy or difficult is it going to be to assess the future and the direction that Indian cities and its architecture will take? Is it a sense of impossibility? Is it a sense of what is going to be our next step? Because we're going to have huge, huge challenges. But what's important is that we are going to have a huge influx of people from the rural areas to the urban areas. 30 Indians are leaving rural India to settle in urban India every minute. And this is going to be the largest urban movement in the world. So what does that mean? With this comes, of course, challenges, but also comes a lot of opportunities that will go with us. Uh, 
and each one of you i know the hall is full of young people today each one of you is going to be part of that magnificent opportunity ahead of us today i'm going to talk about my experience in mumbai working and living as an architect over here uh, most of you know that mumbai bombay is a series of seven islands which came together in the 19th century and of course today we have mumbai and navi mumbai and any architect who works uh, and lives in the city naturally takes cognizance of all these areas that is around the changes have been huge especially since 1980 the photograph on the top shows cuff parade um, until 1960 or 1970 in fact even until 1980 when nariman point got reclaimed it looked like this i remember walking uh, on the elevated platform and the photograph below shows how it is today the oval maidan uh, which is in the heart of the historic fort area of of mumbai or bombay had the wonderful victorian gothic buildings on one side and in the 1930s the art deco buildings came in as modernity began to creep into the city then of we have the historic flora fountain and hutatma chowk below shows what the motor car has done to all our cities then of course with uh, urbanization the motor car has taken over it's not just come for parking it's taken over our cities and the disconnect between buildings and the street has gone as we have you can see the flyovers on the right and left of in, of even very historic monuments within the heart of the city so this is mumbai maximum which we all have live in and of course if the density is growing by the minute and the number of people coming in for hope for opportunity in the city is happening all the time today i'm just going to choose uh, some of my work uh, i'm going to concentrate in the city of the work that i've done in the city of mumbai but my practice has extended from the himalayas right down to the southern tip of india and from the eastern part of the country to bodh and kutch and the deserts of the western side i've built through central india uh, both in rural and urban communities and i think that's perhaps helped me uh, feel comfortable in the space uh, that i work in and uh, the fact that mumbai is my city and it's very very important for me that it survives to go back to a simple thing that jane jacob said but which is so important even today what are the six points you need for a city to survive they're actually quite simple we need pavements to walk on we need public spaces plazas parks we need old and new buildings we need diversity of a district residential with commercial we need the neighborhood stores and we need the short legs of intersecting streets so these are some of my projects in mumbai i've highlighted uh, only a few you can see kalaba at the bottom of the map the fort area lower perel then up north up to andheri and then i've chosen a project uh, in navi mumbai uh, which is called san pada so a city should be remembered for equality a sense of place or a sense of community or i'm sorry a sense of continuity that professor maneo said yesterday a sense of belonging and adequate infrastructure to take sense of equality first arif hasan a pakistani architect said if the present trends in many cities continue the rich poor divide will worsen evictions will increase and a sense of exclusion will grow stronger with not only the poor but also the rich living in ghettos the rich surrounded by armed guards and security systems he suggests the creation of a hypocritic oath for planners obliging them to include the marginalized in every stage of their work personally i have always advocated the role of the architect has to go beyond buildings dramatic social change does happen in urban anonymity and commerce has helped break down centuries of discrimination for people who come to the cities slowly but surely so 
So for equality, I have chosen uh, a park which I helped uh, design in 1989. It was a garbage uh, dump, but like Mumbai, and unlike, say, Cape Town in South Africa and other parts of the world, uh, we are surrounded on one side, we have the high rise, we have the slums, and I'm not going to call them informal housing because I don't think slums necessarily has to be a derogatory word. So we're surrounded by all different types of economic situations. And a group of us got together, uh, we cleared, uh, we worked with the government. It was one of the first public-private partnerships and we created something called the Calaba Woods. Now why this was important was, uh, it was the first time that a public-private partnership happened for public space in Mumbai so long ago and became a precedent for many other parks as time moved forward. Uh, it's still there today, threatened by the metro, but the citizens are fighting for it. So finally, there has to be the stakeholder who's going to survive for the protection of the public spaces within the street. It cannot be the government, it cannot be the politicians or the bureaucrats, and we all know that very well. The second project in equality, uh, I've chosen a small church in Navi, Mumbai, because for me, uh, equality comes with freedom of religion, and uh, the new city, uh, this was one of the, they were given a small piece of land to build a very small church. The, of course, they had a very small budget as well. And I literally had to put the cross outside uh, on the compound wall. Uh, there was no money for everything. It was sculptural. We brought the cross in through the sculptural qualities and architectural qualities. And the church was consecrated. Um, in, 2000, in uh, 2001. From the church to go to a temple, also in, um, in um, North Mumbai, it was an ashram where uh, the clients came to me and said that um, the temple, they wanted to redo the plaza of the temple, but the, the flower, flower dwellers uh, wouldn't move who were in the middle of the plaza. And they said, we've built them another space. Why are they not moving? The reason they were not moving was nobody ever asked them what they wanted. And that is why, as an architect, you have to be the client and the architect and understand what it is, however big or small, in the city. All they wanted was a space below where they could store the flowers that had not been sold the previous day, a place to hang their flowers, and most important, they wanted to be on the route to the temple, because if they were not on the route to the temple, nobody would stop and buy their flowers. So this is how they were earlier. Then they refused to move. We enabled them to move. This is what we built for them. Very, very simple. But they were with us. They were part of us. That was the equality of the role of the architect. And then we were able to uh, repave the temple. A sense of place. A sense of place that we, so privileged to live in Mumbai have, cannot be destroyed. Revitalizing the older parts of our cities, rather than knocking them down, brings huge benefits. It retains our sense of place and history. If we don't preserve the past, we have no future. Why are so many European cities so beautiful? Because their central cores with their plazas and gardens and public spaces are carefully nurtured and preserved. We must, ensure, excuse me, we must ensure that too. Our sense of place is also connected in Mumbai to our natural heritage, which includes our mangrove swamps, our beaches, and of course our RA National Park, which is now currently again being threatened by the new DP plan. So for a sense of place, um, we have just completed the restoration of the Rajabai Tower. Uh, it was built in the 19th century and had never been restored. At one time, some of the stained glass was restored. The tower once faced the, the sea, but as you can see, some of the Victorian Gothic buildings, the High Court and all came up. And across the Oval Maidan, you have the wonderful Art Deco collection of buildings. Uh, it was in a bad condition, as many, many historic buildings are in Mumbai. The clock was not working properly. There were no drawings. Uh, the wonderful figures on the top had, had, of course, eroded as the different types of stone. And the wonderful views were from the top. We could, we could actually see the figures at the top, which we had not seen before. And a few pictures of pre and post restoration we have completed. It is part of the university library. 
and our work is over. There's just a little bit of interior work to be done, and we hope it will now be open to the city. The historic fort area of Mumbai is very close to the Rajabaita, and there are three or four buildings which I'm going to show you quickly here. Why it's important is because uh, with this, a gentrification took place. And gentrification does not have to be an elitist word. It really means a pride in what you have, what's gone before, and raising standards and aspirations. And it affects everybody because lakhs and lakhs of people come into the historic core of Mumbai every day. So this is what we did not do when some clients of ours bought the TCS house in 2005. The entire center of the building had imploded and we had to rebuild it, um, keeping the entire perimeter of stone very, very safe. Uh, I said it uh, jokingly in the beginning, but the client accepted it. And then I had nightmares because we had to work through cyclones, but we saved the entire perimeter. We, uh, we broke down the inside and rebuilt from the basement upwards. It was in a very important corner of the city, and if it had been demolished, the entire sense of continuity and, and sense of place would have gone. At the same time, we upgraded the interiors, we used some of the old furniture, we brought in light. So it's not as though if you keep old buildings that you're not moving forward in time as all cities. The three cathedral senior schools, uh, the three cathedral schools the junior, middle, and senior, also built in the 1860s, uh, was something we took from 1994 to 2003, and their church as well. You can see that um, these were the three schools, and the church was also very, very close. The difference here was the schools had to be expanded, so they had beautiful, a part of, the, of each one of these buildings was beautiful, but interventions had taken place over the years, uh, built in the 70s when sand was very adulterated. So they had really very, they had gone down very rapidly. So we broke some of those 70 buildings down and we restored the old part. You can see how interventions can ruin areas. This is a picture of before and after. Toilets come in, water seepage. And then what we did was, was within the same existing heights uh, or within the same line, we added to the buildings as we did here for one of the schools, the middle school and the senior school, we added an additional floor on the top. So there are many, many ways that one, the most important thing is to save the embodied energy of our buildings and yet make them relevant for today. Then the trustees came to us for the St. Thomas Church and they said there was heavy leakage. It's a wonderful church, it's the oldest church in Mumbai and that is how Church Cake got its name. It became a cathedral only in the 1800s, although it started in the 1700s. And I remembered this postcard which I'd seen somewhere where the roof over the apse was actually a pitched roof. And I figure that maybe the leakage was taking place because that had been removed and a flat RCC roof, which you can see in the upper left corner, had been provided in the 1920s and 1930s. So with a conservation a friend of mine, Sandhya, uh, we reconstructed this entire roof. It wasn't easy. We had to work on levels. And then we restored the entire church as well, which now functions with the cathedral schools. Um, and makes a, a complex and self-sustaining. At that time, there were pavements were going down. Now, of course, the situation's even worse. But even in the 1990s, uh, I convinced the client that we had to do the footpath. And many of the clients of mine in the historic area, we used to make sure that we did the pavements. And these were micro projects, but they're very, very important in a city. And all these small projects, nothing is too small or too big. Uh, to contribute towards the city. And this is the church. And then from there, we, in 2007, we went to the old Yacht Club building, which had been uh, bought, uh, g given over to the Department of Atomic Energy in 1950, and half the building had been broken down because those days there was no value, there was no heritage committee. And then they brought us in. You can see how the building had been sliced uh, in half. And then they were actually going to bring the entire building down. And why this building is important is a group of engineers, not architects, mind you, a group of engineers and uh, archaeologists, historians got together 
And that was the birth of the heritage movement in Mumbai. It was because of this single building. And then we were able to save precincts and at least the historic core of the city, although we're fighting all the time, as many of us know here, uh, is still at least over there. So this was, uh, they were barrel vaulted, wonderful wooden roofs. Uh, they had dance floors with springs and many other interesting things. A sense of belonging is getting more difficult to achieve in our cities because of a large migrant and floating population. That is why it is all the more important that the government and political parties create a sense of belonging and inclusion to all the city dwellers. It is only when this develops will our cities become places of hope and expectation. The personal involvement of the citizenry will increase and sustain these engines of growth. Our country is now a nation of young people. We have 200 million people who are under the age, I think, of 21 or 22 who are going to come in and grow. Their aspirations and dreams are often different from mine. The next decade will involve many changes in the physical look and feel of our cities. These will include buildings that need to be built for the new patterns of behavior of the young. New housing, new shopping, new recreational areas, and the shift of the pulse of Mumbai from being the cradle of manufacturing to supporting primarily service industries. One of the projects we were trying to do with the government was the Mumbai Arts and Crafts Center, which was a sense of belonging to the sewage pumping station. The municipality gave us the site and said, we'll build a center for the craftsmen of rural Maharashtra, the state in which Mumbai belongs. We worked hard on it. We worked on the Vada theme so that the craftsmen would be comfortable there. There were two wonderful chimneys, a brick and a stone and the entire civil work was completed. You can see at the bottom. And then the tragedy struck, the typical tragedy of political parties not agreeing with each other. And after so many years, this is still the state of the Mumbai Arts and Crafts Center. But look at this, a small organization, a small NGO called Voice, Voluntary Organization and Community Enterprise, decide we're looking after the young girls who are sent to stations to beg. They are not orphans. Their parents live in the city. They're very, very poor migrants, often construction labor, and they need the money. A group of people got together called Voice. They got a small piece of land, and they told me that they wanted to build a school, come a residential place for these young girls so that they could teach them to read and write and educate them. Of course, their budget was tiny, but we had a great time working with them and we built this small school, a residential school outside, just outside the city, using, of course, brick and jollies, light coming in in different ways. So as somebody said earlier, the most appropriate solutions are brought about by the least authoritarian approach. We are catalysts in the development process. This street is very important, I feel personally, uh, for belonging because it's a street on which I have worked from 1990 till today. That's almost 25 years. And I'm going to show you four projects that we did on the street within the same boundary and how aspirations and how the city has changed. Of course, this area was the old mill area and we all know uh, what happened, the tragedy of the Supreme Court decision. I have no time to go into that. But the, the first job I did there was in 1990. It was part of a crash, uh, Kamla Mills crash. And you can see this is the entire property that I'm going to discuss. First, I'm taking up this building, which I did. Then we did work on this um, a factory building. Then we built a new building here. And now we're building a new building here. And all are still standing. All are working. All are occupied. And I think that little piece of this road uh, shows how the city has changed. So here we, uh, we were very sensitive to the street. Uh, we, we, bought, uh, we made a series of little um, individual uh, pavilions connected by greenery. And uh, the, the owner still sits there. He loves it. There's a picture of what was his, the kitchen and which we made into his uh, office building. And then we went on to the factory, another client who said he had this factory and he wanted to make it into a learning institute. Where else could we get these sort of heights and sizes and wonderful trusses? It's still there today. We made it into a fashion studio. 
Um, you can see this was the art gallery. We retained all the trusses and we created streets within the entire. So that we feel very sad that a lot of these wonderful buildings have been demolished. This one still stands. This is the library building and uh, the north light comes in. But it did so well as a, a, a sort of a place where uh, Bollywood uh, TV programs could be shot. I think he made more money on that and used it perhaps more for television studios. And this is the design studio there. The same client for whom we did the crash came back to us. And adjoining that, he, had a, he got another piece of land where he said there was a very old shed uh, in a bad condition. It was not a mill building. And he, three of them got together and they wanted a new building. And they thought that I would build them three floors. But what we did was uh, we decided, since it was in that area, we would give each one of them a ground plus two. So we could have gardens in the sky. It could be an eco-friendly building. And then on the top, we would re reflect some sort of sculpture to, to remember the chimneys that had all been demolished. So it's very contemporary, but it's right next door to the other two buildings that I mentioned. This is actually the first floor garden, the picture on the left, and this is the second floor garden, uh, which is currently all existing over there. The fourth is now the new aspirations. We are working with uh, Pay, I am Pay's office, Pay Carbon Free from New York, and we are building the skyscraper. I think tall buildings, we cannot fight that. Uh, we thought, thought a lot about working on this project and why it was important for us. I think it was a great learning process and uh, we understood what is going to be the future in many, many ways of tall buildings, in terms of sway, in terms of dampers. It was a technical. It also showed us that this is what is going to happen to a lot of the city. Uh, we have buildings in Pedro, like Korea's Kanchenjunga, which was tall for its time. So how fast and how, how quickly is this, uh, the city going to change in its skyline? How is the infrastructure going to be provided? These are all questions which have to be asked and have to be answered as well. Um, the buildings are coming up fast, and uh, that is the fourth building on that street. You can see the views, how different they are as the one from Rajabai Tower. Infrastructure. Infrastructure, I think all of us know about infrastructure. We need new roads, bridges, walkways, power, water, sewage, waste and rainwater, corollaries to what I have talked about. But there are many examples of public-private partnership and many cities and other developing, fast developing countries around the world, especially Central and South America, have led by example. So we have to see how communities can be active stakeholders in determining the course of a city's growth while preserving what has gone before in creative and relevant ways. So t for that, I have just chosen a project that my foundation, the HECAR Foundation, it's an acronym for Heritage, Education, Conservation, Architecture, and Restoration, uh, which we worked with apostrophe, uh, Professor Sidhu, an urban design firm concentrating on the heart of the city. Between the VT stations and church gate stations, we have seven to eight lakh commuters coming in every morning. They are just thrown out of the trains and then they are thrown out of the stations into a sea of cars, honking taxis cars who just don't care about them. And they build these underpasses which are absolutely inaccessible, they're filthy and dirty, uh, they have no, nothing for the dis uh, differently abled, nothing for pregnant women, not safe at night. So we have 100 acres of land between the VT station, the Churchgate station, and the museum. And all we need to do is to make this contiguous by having the few roads which cross this green underground. This is happening all over the world. It was such a simple solution. It was almost too simple for them. Maybe there weren't enough ways for them to do what they all need to do, the politicians. And we have been working on it for two years. We're not going to give up. We're still going to try. Um, you can see what we want to do is to create plazas by taking the cars underground. Uh, we have beautiful buildings. That's the Eros Cinema on the top, one of the most important Art Deco buildings in Mumbai. And you can see the condition of the pedestrian subways that exist in the city. This could be the plaza in front of the VT station. 
and of course the museum plaza, we wanted to pedestrianize it. When we had almost got the okay from the traffic department, suddenly the Eastern Expressway opened for a few cars and they blocked it again, saying we don't know how many cars are going to come down the Eastern Expressway into the museum plaza, so we're not going to pedestrianize it, we're going to watch and wait. So in India, you need infinite patience for anything that you want to do. The press supported us, the NGO supported us, people supported us, and, but unless there's political will and bureaucratic will, this is not going to happen. We all know that, but we're not going to give up. As I said, the country is now a nation of young people. We all see a concentration of poverty in cities, but the cities are also the main hope of escaping from this poverty. We will always have urban slums in India, as they are the entry points of the poor into the opportunities that they will receive from the cities. Whether urbanization without migration will work will depend on how smaller towns in India urbanize in the future, the city villages. A book shared by an architect friend recasting India by Hindal Sen Gupta says, India is being recast, remolded, and redefined. He says India's 7,000 biggest companies employ only about 7% of its workforce. The remaining 93% come from what is called the unorganized sector, like unorganized housing, very convenient words. It's a euphemism that straddles all the worlds from a roadside tea shop to a small diamond polishing unit. This is the backbone of the Indian economy, not the large street or the stock exchange. And I think the Ravi is a leading example of this. So what is our future? Architecture like civilization is dynamic and evolving. While exciting architecture is being built all over the world and thus expanding the vocabulary of contemporary architecture, we architects in India have to find our balance in design, enabling us to be part of the new and creative experiments ahead, as well as be part of what has gone before. We work in a world of computer-aided design with its digital design technology, and we need to include all new creative ideas in our practices. Creativity flourishes when new ways of looking at the same problem are brought together when people with different backgrounds, training, and experiences bring together their perspective. I believe that an inclusive practice that spans our diverse population, be it economic or cultural, provides us with great satisfaction. Therefore, the motivation for inclusion and diversity should come not only from the desire to create a just society, but also because it leads to better and more powerful and creative processes and solutions. I hope that when history books look back at the first few decades of the 21st century, they will find an architecture that responded to the wonderful traditions of India combined with the needs of its people. Since there's so many young people here today, I want to end with a, with a small story that I heard uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Kailash Satyarthi, talk about. Uh, as most of you know, he won the Nobel Prize uh, and his love and work that he's done for the children of India is huge. And his story was, there was a huge fire in the jungle and all the animals were running away, including the lion. And then the lion saw a small little bird flying towards the fire. So he started laughing at the bird. And he said, what are you going to do with that little bit of water in your beak? You can't put out the fire. So the bird turned around and said, well, at least I'm doing my bit. So I hope all of you, and I certainly want to try to do my bit. Thank you. <laughs>